Afternoon, everyone, Afternoon. and welcome to our worship here in Eglis this Sunday. Uh, just one announcement I'd like to bring at this stage, and that's just uh, that it's with much sadness that we record the death of Mr. Colin Dunwoody of Minterburn Road on Tuesday past. Colin died after a long period of illness and was buried here from the church to Minterburn on a Friday. And we pass on our sympathies to uh, Meredith and Doreen and the whole family circle. And we'll take a moment to pray for them now. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of all faithfulness and love. That you're the God who's always with us. And we just bring the Dunwoody family to you now. We pray for Meredith and Doreen and the whole family circle. That they would know your, your strength, your help your comfort at this sad time as they grieve the the death of Colin. Surround them with your strength and help and just that sense of your loving presence. Today and in the days to come, we pray as they remember Colin and give thanks for him as we do now in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin, we're going to say the call to worship together. So I will read the first of the two verses, then you can join with me, and the words are on the screen. So we'll stand and say it together, and then we'll remain standing um, to sing the 100th Psalm. And if at any point you want to sit down, you can feel free to do so. So we'll stand. Okay. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So we'll remain standing and sing the 100th Psalm.
come to God in prayer, let's pray. Lord, we praise you for you are good and your mercy is forever sure. Lord, we thank you for your truth which shall from age to age endure. Lord, we thank you that we can enter your gates with praise, that we can come to you today with praise, with thanks. Lord, that we can come to you honouring you for who you are. We thank you that you are the God who's loved us with an everlasting love that you're the God who's loved us and revealed that love in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for how in Christ you've clothed us with righteousness. Lord, for how by your Spirit we know that we are your children. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you today in Christ, knowing that there's now no condemnation for us. Lord, that there's nothing that can separate us from your love in your son father we thank you that even now the lord jesus is sitting at your right hand that he's praying for us and representing us before your throne we thank you that he is for us and not against us lord we thank you that you are the faithful god the unchanging god that you all always are and always will be the same faithful God. Lord, we thank you that your love is unchanging, that you keep us in your love. You, you will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. Lord, we thank you for your spirit and for how he's changing us to be like Christ, for how in him you're working all things for our good and your glory. Lord, as we come to you today, we pray for your continued work in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. We pray that you would give us an ever-increasing hatred of sin and an ever-growing love for you and love for all that's good. Lord, help us to honour you this day and in the days to come with our words, with our thoughts, with our actions. Forgive us for how we so easily go our way and not yours, for how we so easily live without truly looking to you and trusting you. Forgive us, we pray, Lord, and continue your work in us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to look to you today, that as we come to you in worship, that you would help us to fix our hearts and minds upon you. Where we perhaps come with distractions or where we come with concerns or worries, we just bring them to you and ask that you would take them from us and that instead you would help us to focus our hearts and minds on you, on who you are. We thank you, Lord, for how you've revealed yourself in your word, how you've revealed your character, your mercy, your love, your holiness, for how you show us and call us to come to you in Christ. And also, Lord, how you uh, show us how to live for you. Lord, your love has made us more content than all the treasures of the earth ever could. And Lord, we know that we could not and would not ever have loved you if you had not loved us first. So as we worship you today, we worship you for your everlasting love, which has sought us and bought us, re redeemed us, renewed us, and brought us back into a right relationship with you. Through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to read together from God's Word. And this morning, we come to the last in our series in the, the story of Abraham. And we're going to read together from Genesis 25, verses 1 to 11. So it's on page 26 in the Pew Bibles. So do please turn with me. Genesis 25, verses 1 to 11.
So this is the word of the Lord. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and, and Dedan. The descendants of Dedan were the Asherites, the Ledishites, and the Laamites. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanok, Abida, and Elda. All these were descendants of Keturah. Abraham left everything he owed, he owned to Isaac. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Altogether, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years. And he was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre, in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived near Beer Lahai Roy. And we thank the Lord for this reading of his word. Before we study that passage together, we're going to stand and sing together again. Great is thy faithfulness.
Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, as we sing of your faithfulness, we thank you that as we turn to your word now, we see once again your faithfulness, your faithfulness to your promises, your faithfulness to your people, your faithfulness to who you are. Lord, come and help us to trust you in your faithfulness. Help us to grasp a vision this morning more and more of who you are and your faithfulness to us. We pray in in Christ, the ultimate fulfillment of your promises, in whose name we pray. Amen. In life, you, you find that life usually kind of follows an everyday pattern, punctuated every now and again with highlights as well as more difficult times. And the spiritual life is really much the same. There's times of great blessing, great growth, great encouragement, times when God's very obviously at work, also times of real struggle and trial. But between that, there's kind of more everyday living. And that's the same for the spiritual life and the spiritual walk as well as everyday life. Things that are, everyday life is kind of more low key, more normal, so to speak, more ordinary. But there are these punctuations on either end of the spectrum um, as well. Well, this morning we come to what in some ways seems like quite an everyday passage. A lot of the highlights of Abraham's life, so to speak, are are in the past, decades before this, where God met with him in powerful ways. God spoke to him in powerful ways. But here it's more everyday life, family life. And albeit his family life looks very different from what it looks like for ours, as we'll see, um, it still is everyday life through to the end of his life. And as we come to that point, the end of Abraham's life, we're led to ask, well, what did Abraham's journey of faith achieve for him? Was it worth it? The sacrifices, the, the effort, the pain? And did God indeed fulfill his promises, the different promises he made to Abraham? Well, regarding the promises, the answer is yes and no, or maybe more accurately, yes and not yet. Yes, God had begun fulfilling his promises to Abraham, but by the end of his life, they still weren't fulfilled completely. He had a single son of promise and a single field, but for all the promises, that's all he had at this stage. For the promises of land, of descendants, of of blessing and so on, at this stage, it's just a glimpse And yet Abraham died as he lived. He died in faith, trusting and knowing that in God's time and God's way, his promises would be fulfilled. As I said last week, that's really what the story of Abraham is about. Yes, in some ways it's about Abraham's faith, but even more so it's about the faithfulness of God to his promises and to who he is. And this morning, as we come to this last part of the the story, We're going to see that again. And we might think, well, surely it would be more benefit to us to look at his faith and think what we can learn from that. But actually there's great benefit to us to look at God's faithfulness. Because in looking at God's faithfulness, we find ourselves encouraged in our faith. Encouraged that we can trust God in life as well. So that's what we're going to look at today and see how God continues to fulfill his promises. And there's three things I want you to see in the passage today. First of all, God's promises are often fulfilled in the most everyday of ways, the most everyday ways. Then God's promises give hope where there appears to be none. And thirdly, God's promises do not depend on you and me, which is a good job. But firstly, God's promises are often fulfilled in the most everyday ways. All the way through Genesis, we've seen these promises God has made made to Abraham. Promises of land, of offspring, of being the father to many nations, of being blessed, that he would be a blessing to others. But as I've said, all he has at this stage are this single son of promise in a single field. Yet as we see in these opening verses, a load more children appear along the way. He takes another wife whose name is Keturah, and we read here of, of them having six children before the children go on to have children and grandchildren and so on. 
And in one way, this is a bit surprising, given Abraham's age. At 100 years old, he felt he was past it with regards to having children, as we saw in chapter 17, understandably so. So maybe it's surprising from there, but equally it's also a fulfillment of promise, of descendants, chapters 13, 15, 17, 22. And we might think that this is a fulfillment of that promise, but there's a detail here that tells us that actually it's not. That for all the children he's fathered, that Abraham leaves everything he owns to Isaac. Well, why was that? Well, it's because Isaac was the child of promise and the descendants were going to come through him. God's family were going to come through him. The promises would be fulfilled through him. Now, just in case we think Abraham's a right old Scrooge and left all the others to fend for themselves, we see that whilst he was still living, he, he gave gifts to them, to the sons of his concubines, in other words, the sons of Hagar and Keturah, and then sent them away from Isaac to the east. So he did provide for the others, but he, he left everything at the end to Isaac. And that leads us to verse 8, where we read that then Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and full of years. I said at the start, God's promises are often fulfilled in the most everyday ways. And that's what we see here. Because back in chapter 15, the Lord had promised him, you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Well, here he is, 175, surely a good old age in anyone's language. And then the burial, verse 9, in the cave of Machpelah, near Mamre, so in the field of Ephron, the field, in other words, that Abraham had bought so he could, buy, so he could bury Sarah in chapter 23, the field which was the beginning of the promise of land being fulfilled. So there's a promise fulfilled. And likewise, we see more promises fulfilled in 12 to 18. We didn't read it, but if you scan through it, you see, you see it's a lot more names. It's the sons of Ishmael. And again, chapter 17, the promise that came that Ishmael would have uh, many children, that God would increase his numbers and make them the, the father of 12 rulers and into a great nation. So here they are, Ishmael's sons, 12 tribal rulers, promises fulfilled. And also the promise fulfilled that they'll live in hostility towards all their brothers. That was promised as well. So everyday things, low-key things, Nothing very spectacular here. In some ways, oh, oh, of course, the birth of any children is spectacular in, in many, uh, of course. But here as we dig through them, we see all kinds of traces of faithfulness of God to his promises, which is a good thing. Because life normally goes on in a low-key, everyday fashion. Yet just because things are happening in an everyday way doesn't mean God isn't working. Doesn't mean God isn't ruling and overruling things. Blessing us, showing his faithfulness to us, working in his spirit by us. And yes, we pray for those times and look to those times where God works powerfully and, and works in, in very obvious ways, but equally in the everyday things of life, we look to God and trust him with all that life brings because he works in everyday life. Thinking about the church, occasionally God brings revival and we pray for revival, but usually things are more every day. But God's still working and we still look to him and still pray for him to be at work and still honor him as he works and trust him to do so. His promises are often fulfilled in everyday ways. But also God's promises appear to give hope, or sorry, do give hope where there appears to be none. Here we read something of great historical significance, biblically, the death of Abraham. So this man whose story we followed from chapter, uh, I think chapter 12, whose story we followed since our new year, really. His death is recorded in verse 8, and we read that he was gathered to his people. The hero of the faith, his father of the faith, is gathered to his people. Now we might think, well, what does that mean? Does that just mean he died? or that he was buried with his ancestors. Well, if we think about the phrase, we read it state used of various other people in the Bible. 
Later in this chapter, we see it said of Ishmael. It's also said of Isaac, Jacob, and also Aaron and Moses that they were gathered to their people. And it doesn't mean simply that they died, or no, and nor does it mean they were buried in their ancestral grave. Because Abraham wasn't. Yes, it was his grave he'd bought, but his ancestors weren't there. And Aaron and Moses weren't buried with their forefathers. So it doesn't mean burial either. So what does it mean? Well, the Bible commentator, Dr. F. Davis, says this, that if Abraham, for example, is gathered to his people, it implies that his people still exist in some way, even though they're dead. So the implication is that God's people survive in some way and go on to join their ancestors in some way. They're gathered to their people. Now you might well be thinking, well, we know that from the Bible. We know that those who trust in the Lord go to be with him in heaven when they die and are, re re are reunited with the rest of God's people. We know that. And yes, we know that from the New Testament, but the Israelites didn't. And according to the Old Testament, they didn't take much interest in life after death. But here we see this acknowledgement that life continues, that our souls are immortal, that for those who are the Lord's, they go to be with him in heaven, and those who aren't are separated and taken and go to be in hell. That's what the Bible shows us and becomes clear as it unfolds. But here in Genesis, right back at the start of this Bible, we're given this hint of hope. This hint that for the Christian there's more. That death for the Christian is far from hopeless. This note that death doesn't mean the end for the Christian or annihilation for the Christian, but that there's hope. Hope to tell us that we don't need to fear what comes next, but that we can trust God in his faithfulness. Trust God will continue his care for us. God's promises bring hope where there appears to be none. But finally, God's promises do not depend on you or me. If you think back through history, maybe sporting history or, or military history, you'll know or you might be able to think of one or two leaders whose death or retirement led to a great change on, on their team or army's fortunes. On the sporting front, the person who came to mind was Sir Alex Ferguson. Firstly, when he left Aberdeen, they'd had far and away their most successful period in their history, winning leagues and cups and um, European Cup Winners' Cup. Their most successful period, but as soon as he left, things went downhill after that. And of course, much the, said, much the same could have been said about Man United when he left them as well. Things went downhill after they left Manchester United. And often the same thing happens when a team's captain goes off injured. And with regards to the military, I was reading this week about an Arab uh, war leader, or an Arab army leader, Kamel Arakat, who served in the Arab-Israeli war in 1947 to 48. And how his troop had made great leadership under his, or great progress under his leadership with the aim of recovering land they'd lost, only for the troop to fall apart when, due to injury, he was taken off the battlefield. Teams and armies who whose plans fall to pieces without the presence of their leader, without the main man at the helm. So the question is now, what's going to happen without Abraham? What's going to happen that the main man, so to speak, is off the scene here? What will the future hold with regards to this unfolding plan of God? Well, what do we read? Verse 11, after Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who then lived near Beer. The high Roy. We see very similar uh, wording to this in other books of the Bible after so and so's death, or after the death of so and so. It's used in Joshua 1 when Moses dies, dies. It's used in Judges 1 when Joshua dies, and 2 Samuel 1 when Saul dies. And on each occasion, it marks the end of an era, a turning point in history. When a leader dies, and the same question that's asked, that could be asked, that is asked then, that is asked here, or implied here at least, what happens next? What will happen without Moses? He's led us through 
the wilderness from Egypt to the edge of the promised land, what's going to happen now? We need to go forward without, without him. Or what will happen without Joshua and his great military leadership? Or what's going to happen following the death of, of Saul? The armies and tatters, Philistine are occupying a lot of the northern part of Israel. What's going to happen without Saul as leader? Well, here when we ask what's going to happen without Abraham, Genesis 25 tells us, well, things will continue on just fine. God will bless Isaac. Isaac will walk by faith. And in his faithfulness, God will use him in the same way he used Abraham. Because God's servants die, but God's plan continues. The man, of woman, the man or woman of faith may die, but God remains faithful as ever. It can be a bit like that in church life. We can wonder, what will we, what will we do without so-and-so? Will Christ continue building his church? Well, Christ's plan will continue. The church around the world continues to be built. God continues drawing in people who then serve him and, and follow him. The promises don't change. God doesn't change. Abraham's not available. Well, God will find an Isaac instead or use an Isaac instead. God's work doesn't depend on you and me, or other, in other words. Yes, he calls us to his service. Yes, he holds out to us the amazing privilege to serve him and follow him as Lord. But it doesn't depend on us. God is not frustrated if we're unavailable for the job. Because the work depends on him. And we can trust him with, the, with his work. Yet still he says, come and follow me in faith. Because I want to use you. I want you to know the blessing of serving me. I want you to know the blessing of following me, of, of working in my service, of giving yourself to my service. That's what God says to you and me. Come and know the blessing of following me. Do you know that blessing? Are you knowing that blessing of following God, of, of trusting him, of, of giving your, yourself to him? Because Abraham did. Abraham knew the blessing because he lived by faith in a faithful God. These 17 weeks have shown us something of that wonderful faithfulness of God. The wonderful faithfulness of God to his promises, of God to himself, to his plan. Faithfulness to his promises in the everyday things as well as the more spectacular things. Faithfulness to his promises in the difficult times of life, those times that seem hopeless, in the changes of life. God remains faithful because that's who he is and he doesn't change and I think that's what we can take away today that in all that life brings we can trust God and we need to trust God but alongside that we're called to faith as well because Abraham lived by faith God called him to faith and here Abraham stepped out in faith and God says I'm faithful you can trust me so come to me through Jesus, the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. God says, you can trust me. Look at what I did in sending Jesus for you. Look at what I did in the fact that Jesus went to the cross for you and rose again for you. So come to God through Jesus. And then live by faith day by day by day, moment by moment, and all that life brings, knowing that God's kingdom will come and God's will will be done Amen let's pray together loving Father we thank you that you are the faithful God the faithful one so unchanging Lord and we thank you for how we have seen that faithfulness right through uh, this story of, of Abraham how yes we've seen Abraham's faith but even more so your faithfulness. And in seeing your faithfulness, Lord, we thank you. It's been a clear reminder, but also a clear call for us to trust you. We thank you that you're faithful in the everyday things of life. You're faithful in those times that are difficult, those times that seem hopeless. You're faithful to your promises, Lord. And we thank you that those promises do not depend on, on us, because they depend upon you, the one who is ever faithful, the one who doesn't change, who doesn't 
uh, let your promises down. But rather, Lord, you, you fulfill your promises because you're faithful to yourself and to your people. And we thank you for that faithfulness and how it was shown most clearly in Christ your Son. So help us, Lord, to trust you today, to trust you in those days that are, are low-key and normal, to trust you in those days that are difficult, to trust you in those days when things are going well. Help us, Lord, just to commit our lives into your hands, thanking you for your blessings and trusting the challenges to you and walking with you day by day by day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this stage, uh, just one or two more announcements I want to bring to your attention. I want to very much encourage you to come along to the midweek this Wednesday. This, this week is our, our last midweek before we move to the summer prayer times. Um, so we're in Eglis in the hall this week, Wednesday at 8pm, and our guest speaker is Callum Webster of the Christian Institute. And the Christian Institute is a, a Christian organisation that, that seeks to be a, a Christian influence in a secular world, I think is how they describe themselves. Uh, and they help Christians in areas like politics, in, in legal matters, and just in an everyday ways in, in the public sphere. They help give a Christian viewpoint and guide Christians as well and provide help, I suppose, to help us think through what it looks like to live as a Christian in, in this world where increasingly um, it's a very secular world. So that will help us in our thinking as we learn about their work um, this Wednesday. So please join us Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the hall. And uh, then we're, I think that's all I need to say at this stage, announcement-wise. Um, yes, so that's all we'll mention at this stage. And uh, in a moment, when he comes back in, Owen will lead us in prayer. Uh, but I think we will stand to sing. We'll sing, Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
So Owen will I lead us in prayer. As we come to our prayers for others now, uh, we do want to, uh, there's a, a number of things we would like to remember. Obviously, we can't cover all this morning. Um, definitely the, in the news this week, there's just been so much tragedy and heartache. Uh, but we do want to uh, remember that our police service, especially in the light of the seven men arrested after the attempt uh, to murder uh, one of the senior police officers. Uh, we also want to remember our hospitals this time, who are under particular pressure, uh, especially our GP surgeries, um, which are definitely uh, in need of prayer at this time, and especially for political resolution there to support them. Uh, we also want to pray for our roads, uh, especially after the death of the cyclist yesterday, um, and remember our church family as well, especially our young people. So let's gather together now in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for the love in which you give to us every day. Lord, we want to we just acknowledge the, the, the faithfulness of Abraham today, that although we don't necessarily see your promises being fulfilled, Lord, you're still working in the background. You're still at work in our lives whenever it's just our ordinary mundane lives. But Lord, what you do is spectacular. It is amazing and we know that you love us from the inside out and that our lives can be to the full because you are in it. Lord, as we think of others, Lord, we think of our police service at this time. Uh, the, Lord, for the PSNI that are working diligently to bring justice and peace into our lands. Lord, we just pray that as they work um, in, in, our, in and around our, our province today, Lord, that you would help them and you would help them to serve diligently and with uh, peace and kindness to all of those that they come in contact with. And Lord, especially for our Christian police officers, Lord, and the work that is carried out with the Christian Police Association, Lord, to support them whenever they're unable to be here amongst us. Lord, we pray that you'd be working with them, that you would support them, you'd help them in the work that they do. Help them to raise faith in our police service to raise those who are downhearted, who are filled with the worries of life and in the stress of their uh, particularly uh, demanding job. Lord, help them to live as servants for you, especially in our justice sector. Lord, for our hospitals and Lord, our GP surgeries, Lord, we, we realise and we've heard in the news this week of surgeries that are given back their contracts and uh, Lord, uh, waiting times that are, are starting to skyrocket again and Lord for the, all the pressures that's going on in our NHS at this time Lord we pray for speedy political resolutions that will help to bring down those waiting times that will help support our surgeries and Lord ultimately support those who are most in need in our communities those who need to be cared for those who need to ha have that love, care and support that this world should be offering Lord and Lord, we just pray that uh, you would help bring that resolution, that we would, um, our political leaders would focus on what is truly important at this time. Lord, we also pray for uh, our, our, those on our roads in the week that lies ahead. Lord, we're saddened to hear of an, another death this week of a cyclist who's been killed. And Lord, we just pray for safety for all of those who be on it. For our, our church family here that travel day and daily to work, um, who use the roads uh, for whatever means. Lord, we pray that you would bless them, that you would keep them safe, and that you would help them uh, in the days and months that lie ahead. Lord, we pray for protection for those on the roads, that you would just um, help them to be diligent, to be awake, and to be alert. And Lord, we pray that you would look after them at this time. Lord, we also pray for our church family. Lord, we acknowledge those who are hurting at this moment in time, especially for the Glenwoody family, Lord. And pray that you be drawn alongside them, alongside other members of our congregation who are suffering from the pain and the anguish of loss. Lord, draw close to them, help them, raise them up. 
give them a, a shoulder to lean on and be the support and give them the peace which passes all understanding. Lord, we also pray for our young people this time. Those who have just gone through exams and submissions uh, and those who are still to go through them. Lord, we pray ultimately that they would know that you have a plan for their life. Regardless of the outcome of the exams, you have a plan which will give them life to the full. A plan that they may not even realise at this time. A purpose and a, a duty for their lives. And Lord, we pray that they wouldn't feel the stresses and the strains of the exam period, that they would go into it knowing that you're with them, that you'll help them and help them, Lord. We pray to do their best. And we do pray that they would get the results that they, that they would like. But Lord, help them first and foremost to remember you are with them. Heavenly Father, we also pray that you will help us to remember that you are a good God. You're a God who loves us from the inside out. That your love endures forever. That no matter what we go through, you are there. You are with us through all things. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Now, guys, I have a few things with me this morning. So, got a glass of water, a washing up bowl, and on the screen, a picture of a desert will hopefully appear. Yeah, okay. And there'll be another thing appearing this. Hold on. That'll work better now. Okay. So, why have I brought all these? Well, today is a day called Pentecost Sunday. Now, we don't always remember it in the church, but it's a day when we remember that God, or that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to earth, that when Jesus sent it, went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to earth. So I'm going to think a wee bit this morning about the Holy Spirit and who he is and what he does. So I'm going to read uh, just a few verses now. One of the things Jesus does, and we'll see this in these verses, is compare the Holy Spirit to water. So I'm going to read three verses now where we see this. And it says, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living, of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit with uh, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So Jesus compares the spirit to living water. So that's why I've got some water things with me today. Now, why would I take a drink of water? How, what would I be feeling for me to drink water? Connie? Thirsty, exactly. I'd be thirsty, so I'd drink some water. And water satisfies thirst. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit comes and satisfies our spiritual thirst as well. That when people are led by God to think, I, I would love uh, to know God's love and life within me, that when we come to Jesus, he gives us his Spirit and he satisfies our thirst. Now then if we look up on the screen, this is a desert called the Atacama Desert, which is in Chile, one of the driest places on earth. And as you can see, Really, there's nothing there. There's rocks and sand, and that's it, really. Because there's no water. It's been so dry, there's just rocks and sand. But the next photo will show us what happens when the rains come. So, amazingly, all these flowers appear, all this vegetation, all this color comes. So the, the Atacama Desert is transformed, and so this life comes to it. So water as we see there, brings life. And the Spirit gives life as well. That when, when somebody gives their life to Jesus, it tells us that before, without Christ, we're spiritually dead, but the Spirit comes and gives us life when we come to Jesus. So he comes and brings new life 
within us. So that's another thing he does. He gives us, he brings life. Then the next thing is the washing up bowl. There's no water in this, but I imagine if water was in it, what would we, what would we do with the washing up bowl? Micah. Wash things, Wash things exactly. We'd, we'd clean things. So we use water. Water washes things, cleanses things, whichever word you want to use. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit cleanses us, that the Spirit comes to live inside of us and give us a new heart and washes us clean, that, that Jesus through his Spirit washes us clean. So the Spirit is like water in that sense as well. And then finally, we'll bring up the last slide, and there's this very smooth stone. And you might wonder, well, what's that got to do with it? Um, well, if you've ever been at the seaside and you think about waves pounding the shore, so there's waves pounding the shore and hitting against the rocks. Now, you might think that those rocks remain just the same, that the rocks are that strong, they just stay as they are. But what happens is that the force of these waves hitting these rocks year after year, century after century, changes those rocks. It smooths the rocks. It takes off the rough edges of the rocks. It changes the rocks. And the Spirit comes and he changes God's people. That Not only does he live inside of us and cleanse us, but he changes us to make us more like Jesus. That he works in us to make us like Jesus. You might say he takes off our rough edges. He makes us more like Jesus. He changes us. Now the Spirit does all different kinds, all other things as well. He, he gives Christians boldness and uh, faith to share the good news. He comes and empowers God's people to bring a new life to the church. Also, he produces fruit in Christians, um, things like love, joy, peace, and patience, and so on. And also, he gives gifts to Christians as well to serve within the church. So the Spirit does all different kinds of things, but this morning, we'll think about those few things that water reminds us of. So how the Spirit satisfies our spiritual thirst, how he brings new life, how he cleanses us, washes us, now he changes us as well. So next time you've got a drink of water, you can remember that Jesus hasn't left us on our own, but he sent the Spirit to help us live for him and become like him as well. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that when you went to heaven, you didn't abandon us. You didn't leave us on our own but you sent your loving Holy Spirit to come and live within your church and to live within your people. We thank you for how he brings new life, how he satisfies our spiritual thirst, how he washes us and changes us. And we pray for, your, for the ongoing work of your Spirit within us and within the congregation here, that we would know the life that the Spirit alone can bring, and that we would know you changing us and satisfying us, bringing new life. Lord, we pray that more and more we would reflect you and live for you and grow in love for you. So bless us today and fill us afresh with your spirit, we ask, in your loving and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. So we're going to